Okay? All right. So Aaron came to me at the end of the service, or at the end of the worship there, and said that he's heard whisperings that we focus too much on identity here. I love whisperings. You know what? Um, and then I'll finish what he said. And then he said, uh, he felt like the Lord said, we need more. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. And I, there's a part of me that gets why people think we talk too much on identity. And it's because you probably have this, like, it's really not about us. It's really about him. Okay. And I hope you understand that when we talk about the identity of the, of the human being, of the person, you can't help but in the midst of that glorify who he is. Amen. What we're doing is when we're, when we're restoring the identity of a person, we're restoring who God is in him or her. Yes. You can't help but glorify God when you glorify man. When I ask the Lord what he's thinking about, do you know what he's thinking about? He's thinking about us. Yes. Amen. So if he's thinking about us, I think that's like, whoa, okay, maybe we should be too. Yeah, man. So the idea of restoring who we are as sons and daughters is, is in, in my mind, the most important thing we can be talking about. Amen. Because he is in us. If we walk as servants and slaves in the earth, if we walk as someone who has a taskmaster, that's who they'll know. If we walk as children, as sons and daughters of God, they're going to know a father. Amen. Yes. That's, we have to restore that identity today. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm thankful. Yes. Missed I missed the other part. Help me out. 1,500 years we've been taught something else. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So for 1,500 years we've been taught something else. We've been taught how to be afraid of God. Yeah. We've been taught how to be, oh, we're sinners, and we're ugly, we're awful. And that takes a long time to break. Yeah. I know I've been teaching this for about at least six or eight years, and there are still people that are very close to me that still struggle with that same identity. Amen. He's, he gets upset with me. He's mad at me. He's, Jesus' cross and his blood is just holding back the wrath of God toward me. And I know that we still believe this because when we mess up, we have the echoes. Diane wrote about it this week. We have the echoes of, oh man, you know what, it was okay in the moment, but then three or four days later after you mess up, it all comes rolling back again. The shame. We need to keep talking about this. Because shame is still in existence. Guilt is still in existence. These things are still there. Amen? Amen. So, we're going to keep talking about it. And part of that is also restoring God's identity who he is. Yes. And part of that is in my message today. I'm going to talk to you about end times today. Cool. I'm going to talk to you about what the first century church believed about end times. And since I have been walking with the Lord in this um, grander understanding of him as a king of a kingdom, that understanding of the Lord has caused me to change my view of what I've seen about end times. And I actually begin to read scripture the way scripture actually reads. And when you actually read scripture for what it actually says, you actually hear what it actually says. Amen. And it's different than what has been preached. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about this. I'm also talking about this because next week comes out the revamped version of Left Behind. The Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins book, series. Yeah? Made back in the, I don't know when it was, 90s? Well, Nicolas Cage was trying to get out of debt, so he's starring in the next movie. It comes out October 3rd. And my prayer is that by the end of this, you will reconsider the idea of going to see it. You guys okay? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm going to do this in the most simple way I can. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Amen. I'm, going to, I'm only going to give you that. I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give you what the Bible says. And also, what was historically believed when the Bible was written. 
Is that okay? Yes. That way you can't walk out of here and say, well, Mark's opinion was this, but I know. No, you're going to have to say, well, the Bible says this, and then I'm going to have to decide what I believe about it. You guys okay? Yes. You sure? Yes. All right. So I'm going to address five kind of either words or ideas that we have believed and then show you what Scripture says about them. I'm going to start with that term, end times. Okay? Because I've heard for a long time, and I'm sure everyone that's been in Christian circles for a little while, has heard that we're living in the... Yeah, we're living in the end times. We're living in the last days. We've heard of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and, you know, tsunamis and all these things. They're just, and, you know, preachers and even good meaning Christians say, the time is short, the time is near, you better hurry, get your friends saved, you better get resaved just in case. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. We've heard all this. And it sounds good, but it's back to that 1,500 years of getting scared into the kingdom. I don't see any strength in fear. Amen. I, don't, I don't see any sense in building an army based on fear. True. True. I got lots of scripture. I hope, I mean, okay, he's got a thumbs up. By the end, he's going he's to be tested and love your brother as yourself. Acts chapter 2. Do you have Bibles? Verse 14. I'm just going to start reading. You catch up. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. These men are not drunk. Hallelujah. Pretty bad when a preacher has to get up and explain that my friends are not drunk here. It is only the third hour of the day. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Listen to this. And it shall be in the last days that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Your young men are going to see visions. Old men are going to dream dreams. I'm dreaming more dreams lately. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. I will grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Who's been hearing that one lately? Oh, yeah. Before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When was this? He said it in the Old Testament. It's the book of Joel. But what did Peter believe? This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he's actually saying, men of Israel, listen to these words. It's happening now. It says it twice. It shall be in these last days. And then it says, in these days, he will pour forth his spirit. On that day, God fulfilled what he promised to Joel. That I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Any who welcome me, they're going to come. And not even just the ones that believe. It even said to John that Jesus told him, Hey, look, even the Holy Spirit's in the world convicting sinners on them, resting on them, convicting them concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. These guys, Peter's opinion, he's living in the last day. He's watching himself. He's experiencing living in the last day. It's not just Peter and Acts. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. If you want to turn there, turn there. If you just want to listen, listen. I'm going to be talking really fast today. Because <laughs> I'm going to get through a lot. Now these things have happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and 12. 1 John 2, 18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you had heard that Antichrist is coming, we'll get to him. Even though many Antichrists have already appeared, from this we know that it is the last hour. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son. The disciples and the apostles of the New Testament were fully convinced that they, at that moment, were living in the last days. They believed this. They completely believed this. 
What were then the end times? If they were living in them 2,000 years ago, then we've got to change our perspective of the end times because here we are 2,000 years later still wearing ties and sitting in purple chairs. So either we've got it wrong or the end times last a really long time. Right? By the way, these aren't the only scriptures. There's more. I just brought out several to show you that several different writers all concur that they believe they were living in the last days. Now, we're going to refer back and forth to Matthew 24 here, so you might want to keep your finger in Matthew 24. Can we go there? Because Matthew 24 seems to be the place that we derive much of our last days beliefs from. In Matthew 23, Jesus is pretty much giving the uh, Pharisees a uh, pretty good ridiculing, correcting them. It's the woes to all the Pharisees. And then right at the end of 23, he, he points out the uh, tabernacle to the disciples. And uh, actually, no, the disciples do it. John, uh, Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus came out of the temple and was going away. This is after he was ripping the Pharisees. And when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, and he said to them, do you not see all these things, Jesus said? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, uh, geographically I just need you to know that the Mount of Olives sits here, and as you're sitting on the Mount of Olives, you can look and have a beautiful view of the Temple Mount. So you're sitting on the Mount of Olives, he says, you see that temple right over there? That temple... It's going to be torn down. It's going to be gone. That's what he says here. He says, do you not see these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Many of us have read that scripture, if you have before, and think it's all one question. It's not. It's actually three questions. You have that verse up there? Yeah. So he's at, the disciples are actually asking Jesus three questions. Tell us, when will these things happen? Of course they're asking, all right, when is this whole no stool left upon another going to happen? I want to know. I want to see this. Are we going to be here around you for it? Next one is, what will be the sign of your coming? We're going to talk about that question because many of us think the sign of his coming is when he returns to earth. That's not what he was talking about. Number three, and of the end of the age. Three questions. And the rest of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25 answers these three questions. It's beautiful. These guys believed as a result of what Jesus was going to teach them that they were living in the last days. The reality was, and we find out in A.D. 70, how many historians do we have in the house? What happened in A.D. 70? The temple was destroyed. How did that happen? By the Romans, right? They invade Jerusalem because of all of the, honestly, it's all the fervor that results from Christianity trying to rise in the midst of Judaism. It's a mess. And the Romans think, you know what? We just got to clear house and start over again. So they come in and they destroy the temple completely. And here, they burn it with fire. Here's the really cool part about this. They burn it with fire. What is one of the most important things in the temple in Jerusalem? Gold. And when you burn something that's got gold in it, what happens to the gold? It melts. And where does melting go? Up or down? So as it's burning and the gold is melting, the gold goes into the very foundation stones of the temple. And then when the fire's out, all the guys, including Romans, come in and they pick up every stone to get the gold out. What does it say here? No stone will be left. They dug all the way, historically, it's all proven. They dug down and they got every little bit of gold out. No stone will be left upon another. That symbolized something much bigger than just a temple being gone. It symbolized something greater. It symbolized that the old was over. You have to realize that the Jewish temple, the tabernacle, was the focal point of Judaism. It meant everything to the Jews. It was, honestly, when people were asked 
If a Jew, who's your father? Do you remember what the answer would be? They would say Abraham. They wouldn't say God. Abraham. They were so focused on things other than the person of the Lord that the tabernacle became the focal point of their religion. And when the temple was destroyed, there was this sounding beacon that went out of the spirit. End of the age. The old has passed away. The new has come. That was the last days. The last days wasn't this last days before Jesus returns. In their minds, in first century church, when they're talking about we are in the last days, they are finally seeing the end to an old covenant that was not serving them, that was not bringing them to life, and finally the new covenant, the new kingdom was arising in the earth called the kingdom of God. Amen. Very different than what they thought, though. They thought that this kingdom was going to be Jesus riding on a horse and kicking Roman butt, and then they would reestablish themselves as who Rome was as the center of the world. But he saw that, you know what, we're not going to establish a throne in Jerusalem. We're going to establish a throne somewhere else. It is right here. Think about it. Remember in John 4, when the woman at the well comes to Jesus and says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. Where's, where's Kaylee? Kaylee in the house. Jesus called her, called her woman. That's not good. She doesn't like when I call her woman. That's what I learned that Jesus said that to Woman, believe me. An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. An hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So the last days, the end times were, hallelujah, you better get to the mountains as fast as you can. Because when the Romans come, you don't want to be here. You don't want to be a part of this old system finally falling, finally going into the ground so that the kingdom of God can be established in the earth. Those are the last days scripturally talking about. So when you think or hear anybody else talking about end times or last days, guys, I'm sorry, I... I firmly believe Scripture shows us that end times ended in A.D. 70. And now there's a new day we're living in. Amen. When people ask me what's the day we're living in, we're living in the new day. We're living in the day of the Lord. We're living in the day of the kingdom where the kingdom is establishing and yes. growing and expanding of the increase of His government. There shall be no end. Amen. That's the day we're living in. Yeah. So far so good? Yeah. You guys okay? Mm -hmm. Wow, we're quiet. All right, so that's my first one. My second one is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, one of our favorite scriptures. We're going to talk about what the church for so long has been talking about called the rapture. First of all, I just want to make sure. Does everybody know that the word rapture is not the Bible? Right. Right? Okay. Second of all, do you know that the idea of a rapture only started really coming on the scene about the late 1800s? No one ever conceived the idea of a rapture prior to about the late 1800s. I can give you the history of it. There was a uh, Spanish priest who first started it, and then um, John Darby came along and really began to make it popular, and then a little girl had a dream that spoke to this, and before long, they took this little girl's dream and John Darby's words, and it got into the Schofield Bible, and before long now, several generations later, it's now an accepted fact that Jesus will show up, swoop us all off the earth, and take us to heaven with him. Never believed until the late 1800s. Not just the first century church, but even up until the 1800s, no one believed that. It's true. It's true. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. I'm sorry I'm jumping right in the middle of these scriptures, but the context speaks to all of this. If you want to read those scriptures, you can read all of 1 Thessalonians 4 and check it out. Verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout 
with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What a glorious day it's going to be. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Is anybody else looking forward to the day like me? I am. I can't wait. I can't wait for this day to happen. And even verse 18. Therefore, you comfort one another with these words. Now the reason why throughout the New Testament you see so much about comforting one another and encouraging one another and building one another up, you guys have to realize how much intense persecution the church was under during this period of time. I mean, everywhere they went, there were people that were hungry for what they were preaching and there were people that wanted to kill them for what they were preaching. It was like two opposite sides of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, give us, give, give us more, give us more. We will kill you if you say more. So there had to be this constant, ongoing encouragement and, and consolation and prophetic. That's where the term prophetic actually started. Prophesy to your brethren. Edify them. Build them up because they need it. Because every day they face the sword. Amen. That's the times in which the New Testament was being written. So in Thessalonica, there was intense pressure. People were being jailed. People were being hanged. People were being beaten for their faith and their belief. And so Paul's like, you know what? i got to give them some hope about a future. There's a future coming that's going to be good. Amen. And here it is. Your Jesus is coming back. Amen. He is. He's going to return. It's going to be beautiful. So let's comfort one another with these words that the dead in Christ will rise first. And verse 17 is this verse that we kind of bring our rapture theology into. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. First of all, some versions of the Bible have the word caught away. It's a bad translation. It is caught up. The word is harpezo, Greek word for harpezo. And it means to take for oneself. It means to, to seize. It's actually, it's an intimate term. It's as if a lover takes his lover and brings him close to her. Brings her close to him. It's an intimate term. It's like Jesus when he was on the Temple Mount and he looks out over Jerusalem and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, how I desire that I could gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks. That's the same word that's used there. He catches us up together. It's the idea of the bridegroom. Do you know how it was in Jewish days when the bridegroom would ride in, when she heard the bride, would hear that the bridegroom was running in? You've got to think like a Jew here when you read the Bible. When the bridegroom, and they would hail from a long way off, the bridegroom cometh. And the bride would leave wherever she was and run out of the city to meet him. And then she would join him outside the city and then join and enter in with him into the city. Amen. That's what this term harpezo means. It also means this. If you actually go to the, uh, the Vines Dictionary, which is one of the main dictionaries of the Bible, it's as if um, it's the special idea. I'm just going to read you what it says here. It's the special idea of an official welcome of a newly arrived dignitary. Think about this. If you invited someone to your city and they had to fly in, right, would you make sure that they got to your house safely or would you go to the airport to meet them? Of course you would. You would make sure that you greeted them at the airport. This is exactly what Jesus is doing and what the bride of Christ, the church, is doing. It's meeting the Lord and welcoming Him where? To the earth. The meeting with the Lord is not is not for the purpose of leaving the earth. The Greek word is used in the sense of an official welcome. This is still mine. In Jewish culture, the bride would go out to meet the bridegroom with the intent of welcoming her, him to her home. The bridegroom, Christ, does not whisk us away to heaven, but comes to stay with us here on the earth. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. You have to think like a Jew. Think about the parable of the ten virgins. I'm not going to read it to you. It's in Matthew 25. You ever heard of the ten virgins? Five, five were ready, five weren't, right? 
And when the bridegroom came, they ran out to meet him, but the five that weren't ready couldn't run out to meet him because their lamps had no oil, they had no light, it was the middle of the night, so they had to run to go get oil, and while the other ones were lit, they'd run out to meet the bridegroom, they would come in, and before they could get back with oil in their lamps, Jesus would come, and they would go into the house together and celebrate the marriage feast. They didn't leave the city, they went into where the bride was waiting. <coughs> Matthew 25 is a picture of the third question asked in Matthew 24, the end of the age. Luke 17, 26 through 36. Again, these are just verses. Write them down. Luke 17, 26 through 36. And it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came. And destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, and on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. The days of Noah and Lot are compared to the days of the Son of Man. It is not the days of Enoch or Elijah who got swooped up to the earth. He would have said it if it was so. Think about in the Matthew 25, it says that when they were all going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, they all went in, and it says that the door was shut. Does that remind you of a story? Yes. The ark. The ark. The door was <clears throat> No one else could get in. These are, these are, this is the Bible. This is not me telling you. John 17, 15. This is what Jesus prays over his disciples prior to him going to the cross. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Amen. So why would he whisk you out of the world if his prayer to his Father is to keep you? Ooh. We okay? These are the scriptures. This is the actual language. This is the culture in which they live. This is the understanding of the first century church. When they read this, they understood this. They didn't have an 1800s or 1900s view of, you know what, the sin in the world is too bad. Just get me out of here. I want to escape. The kingdom doesn't want to escape. The kingdom says, I want to advance. Yes. I want to occupy until he comes. Amen. Yes. Why advance the kingdom if you're going to get swooped away? Why all this investment in the earth? Doesn't the earth groan waiting for something? Amen. Does the earth groan waiting for us to leave? No, no. no, the earth groans waiting for us to manifest. The earth groans waiting for the sons of God to stand upon the earth and say, this is ours. It's the way it was always supposed to be. Amen. Let us walk on the earth like sons and daughters. Amen. Yes. And as we do that, Jesus is like... Daddy, do you hear what I hear? I hear I hear the earth saying, it's time. Yeah. Come on. So far, so good? Yeah. Yes. There's plenty of other scriptures here to support this, but I know what time it is, and I want to get through this. Because, honestly, I don't think this deserves a lot of time. It's not for some, Lord. Thank you, sir. <laughs> this honestly doesn't deserve a lot of time, because what I am doing is telling you what the Bible has said for two uh, well, at least since it's been written, 1,700 years yes. since it's been compiled. Come on. I think what we're supposed to do is unlearn some things. Yes. Come on. And the church believed a lot of this a lot longer than they believed some of the things that we believed. Yeah. If the belief has been for 16 years that Jesus was coming back to rule and reign on the earth, why in the last 200 are we going to be convinced otherwise? Mm -hmm. How about the Antichrist? Oh, yeah. That scary beast is going to come and convince you, Ethan, to walk away from God. There's going to be this one guy. He's going to be a smooth-talking guy. He's going to sit in the throne in Jerusalem, and all the nations are going to follow after him, and he's going to convince them all to walk away from this faith in Jesus. It's ridiculous. It's dumb. Come and follow me, the new world. Come on. Oh, goodness. Some of the videos on YouTube scare me. Can we read some scripture? By the way, Antichrist does never show up in Revelations. You never see the term. Antichrist is not in the book of Revelation. It's only in one man's letters. It's the Apostle John. 1 John 2, verse 18. I'll 
I'll read them to you. You can write them down, search them out later. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. When did Antichrist show up? Feel free to say 2,000 years ago. Thank you. Verse 19. They went out from us. Here's what's going on. The Apostle John was really upset with something called Gnosticism. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Gnosticism was the idea that the more knowledge you had, the closer you were to God. And there were all these levels. And so what you would do, you would become more away from the world and more toward spiritual things. Because the world was evil and spirit realm was good. Can I tell you there's just as much evil in the spirit realm as there is in the world? As anyone has ever been in the spirit realm, ever seen the spirit realm, there's just as much darkness as there is light as there is in the world. It's messy in the spirit realm, too. You've got to know. It's because Satan's called an angel of light. It's messy. Just like it's messy here, it's messy there. But they had this belief that the more we could get away from this and toward that and have more knowledge of God, that we would get higher and higher and higher and higher. And he's like, I'm going to fight against this. Gnosticism was one of the main theologies that fought against Christianity, the early church. But they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you all know. Have I not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth? Verse 22. Who is the liar? The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Can we just believe what the Bible says? Amen. By the way, the term, if you want the Greek word for Antichrist, you're going to be pretty amazed at this definition. The term Antichrist is two words. Anti, which means opposite. Christ, which means the anointed one. It's any voice, any spirit that opposes the anointed one. Yes. Right. It's not a person. That's right. It's a spirit. Yes. Biblically proven. It's not one person that's going to show up on the scene and deceive the whole world. It's been doing it for 2,000 years. You've been under its spell. I've been under its spell. Until we came to a knowledge of the truth. John is the only one that talks about it. He talks about it a little bit more in chapter 4. Be, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So the Antichrist says the opposite. Have you ever talked to someone who just, you know, I love God. Oh, yeah, I pray to God. But as soon as you start talking about Jesus, <laughs> do you ever feel that? Yeah. I've talked to people who love God. And now those are the same people that say, you know what, Muslims really aren't that far away from Christianity. When you think of it in terms of God. That's why I rarely talk about it in terms of God. I talk about it in terms of Jesus as the Son and God as the Father. When you start talking to even Muslims about God being the Father, something begins to happen on the inside of them. At first they go, but then something on the inside of them goes, oh my gosh, why is that vibrating? What is that? And before all, they start having dreams about this Son of God. They start seeing Him because they can't help but see Him. This is this. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming. And now it is already in the world. Right? Next letter. Real easy. It's just a couple verses. 2 John 7, 9. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished. Don't let Christianity be watered down to just God. He gave His Son to reveal the Son in you. Yes. That's why identity is so important. You don't have to talk about identity if it's just some God.
who's going to whisk you away. No, he's a son. Remember what eternal life was? Jesus described and defined eternal life for us. It's not going to heaven and living with Jesus forever. It's knowing the Father Amen. and the Son. Yeah. That's eternal life. Amen. How are we doing? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Let me just give you a really quick overview of the book of Revelation. I'm telling you, I'm shotgunning this. I mean, you're just going to have to pick it up. The book of Revelation. You guys okay with that one? Antichrist is not some guy coming in the future. It always was on the earth. always will be. Until finally, Jesus says, that's enough. Oof. Actually, we're supposed to be doing that. Rule and reign. The last enemy to be put under his feet is death. So, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Turn there. Let's remember what the book of Revelation is all about. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Stop! If you remember that the rest of the book is about Jesus, everything changes. That's what the book's about. It's about Jesus. In fact, again, thinking as a first century believer, thinking as John the Revelator, you realize that most of Revelation has already happened. Most futuristic teachers of the Bible, of prophetic end times and all that, will tell you that pretty much all of Revelation is going to happen. That's not true. Most of Revelation has already happened. It's already historically proven. Up until verse chapter 19 has already occurred. I can historically prove that for you. We can sit down and we can talk about it. One of the main reasons for this revelation was to encourage Christians suffering intensely brutal persecution, mainly from Rome. I'm just going to give you some overview here. Chapters 6 through chapters 18. If you're not writing down, I'm surprised. Describe the kingdom of God's expansion over the earth. That's what the main part of the book of Revelation is all about. 6 through 18. For example, I'm going to give you one example. Let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 12. You keeping up with me okay? If your head's spinning, just, just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. <laughs> Chapters 12 and 13, historically, and I'm not just saying the first church, I'm even talking about historians in the next several hundred years, were very convinced, it's proven by multiple historians, that they all believe chapters 12 through 14 are all about the Roman Empire. It's not about some future thing that's going to happen. It's all about the Roman Empire. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. i got to get my Bible here. So a great sign appeared in heaven. It's it scary. Oh. <clears throat> a woman clothed with the sun and the moon and under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars and she was with child and she cried out, cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and on his heads were seven diadems and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman and was about to give birth so that when she gave birth he might devour the child. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations. Who's that? When did that happen? 2,000 years ago. Thank you. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. When did that happen? 2,000 minus 33, right? The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. I'm not going to give you all the symbolism here, but just work with me. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels warring with the dragon. Okay, so where is Jesus right now in the story? He just ascended, right? In A.D. 33. So he has just ascended. We're in A.D. 33, according to John the Revelator, chapter 12. So far, so good? Am I telling you anything that the Scripture is not saying? No. Thank you. And there was a war in heaven. When was the war in heaven? A.D. 33. When were you told that there was a war in heaven? And a third of the angels were swooped down. When did you when were you first taught this? When did you believe? Many people believe it was before the world was ever created. 
That's why you see all these prophetic things about Son of the Dawn and Isaiah and Ezekiel. But I don't understand why this, the Satan was counted among the sons of God and showed up in the throne in the book of Job. And how he's an accuser of the brethren who shows up before the throne of God day and night accusing the saints earlier on in the same book of Revelations. How is that possible if he's thrown down before? That's because when Jesus ascends, sits down at the front throne, Daddy, it is time. Uh -huh. I have done my work. Michael, get busy. Amen. I'm just telling you what Scripture says. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Guys, it's more than just a physical throwing down. He was destroyed. His power was made nullified. Amen. Go read in Colossians what happened to the enemy. Yeah. He was destroyed. He was made publicly displayed, defeated. We give way too much power to the enemy. He is a defeated foe. It is time for the church who has all authority in heaven and earth in Jesus to arise and enforce what he already won. Yes. Mm. Oh, I'm pumped now. Oh my gosh, it's new. Oh. Are you okay? Yeah. Can I keep going? Yes. All right, I don't know where I am. Where am I? Ten. Ten. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come. A.D. 33. It's happened. The kingdom has come. Yes. Amen. It is time for us to walk in the fullness of the kingdom. Amen. Now. Amen. 17, 18, 1900 years ago. Yes. Not sometime in the future. For the accuser has been thrown down, the one who had been accusing us day and night before God. Finally, Jesus finished it, came back, opened up the scroll, said a bunch of cool stuff, and angels start getting kicked out that weren't really good. That is really what happened. His power made obsolete. They overcame him with how? The blood of the Lamb. And the word of their testimony. They didn't love their lives even when faced with death. To remember, they're being encouraged in the midst of Nero persecuting them, burning them, lighting them, and using them as torches in the city streets of Rome. You think your life's bad? Yeah, ISIS looks like babies. We're all in a fervor about this. I'm going to tell you, 2,000 years ago, these guys were doing this and thought of worse stuff than that. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. And woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath and knowing that he's only there for a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Hello, church. This is what's going on in your life right now. Mm -hmm. AD 35, AD 40, AD 50. You know what's going on? He doesn't like you. Because you're the reason why he's not in heaven anymore. The two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman and she could fly in the wilderness to her place where she was nourished, blah, 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 blah. Verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children to keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. He's talking to them. Verse 13, or chapter 13, that the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. This dragon is representative of this evil that has just been thrown to earth. And now a beast rises, fueled by this dragon. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems. And on his head were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. And his feet were like those of a bear. And his mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and his great authority. I'm going to just give you a little insight here, can I? Do you know how many Caesars there were? Seven. Do you know how many... Uh, regions of Rome, there were 10. Do you know, let's just keep going. I, I just love this. I just love how 
It just really all does really work out. They were given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authorities to act for 42 months. Oh my goodness. If you go back in history and look up King Nero or Caesar Nero or whatever you want to call him, he waged a specific war. He declared it so. Let me just give it because I have to have the notes here because I want to be accurate. He started in November of 64. Isn't that weird to actually say November, not of 1964, <laughs> of literal 64. <laughs> He, he waged this war against Christians from November of 64 to June of 68, where he eventually committed suicide in June of 68. How many, you know how many months that is? Wait a minute. That was quick math. Exactly 42 months when he committed suicide. Do you happen to know, in the Hebrew language, that the Hebrew language is also a numeric language? You know how that works? Like Romans have Roman numerals. Well, Hebrew language was actually the same in numbers. That's why you probably heard that in the Old Testament you could actually use numbers to kind of predict the, the coming of Christ and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's true. Well, if you write out the, t the term or the name Nero in Hebrew, I'm just going to give it to you. It's N-W-R. This is an English language just so we can understand it. N-R-W-N and then capital Q-S-R. Guess what those letters work out to numerically in Hebrew? Six, six, six. Say it again. His name, written in Hebrew, equated to the number six, six, six. This was the mark. Whoever had this mark, whoever walked according to this way, whoever walked to this lawlessness, to this Amen. level. Yes. Amen. Oh my. Just tell me what the scriptures say, okay? Yes. Is anybody mad at me yet? No, no. heck no. I hope not. Because I, I, I remember uh, Harold was saying that one of his friends was preaching on this. Harold Everly was preaching on this one time, his, one of his pastor friends. And some lady jumped up in the midst of the service and said, Don't take away my Antichrist. Oh. Seriously. Wow. Can you believe when not only you're presented with these facts, but then actually want to hold on to something like that? It's crazy. So much of what the church in today's society is waiting to happen has already taken place. The future doesn't start happening until Revelation 19 of the coming of the Lord. I just gave you one example. There's tons of examples in Revelation that I can show you. It's either present day or past day events. Finally, can I just do this to be done? Can I define left behind for you? I saved this one for last. Okay, let's go. Two main scriptures where this is used, Luke 17 and Matthew 24. I'll start in Luke 17 just so you can see it, and then we'll finish up in Matthew 24, and then I'll leave you, and then you can talk about me at lunch. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Huge trumpet. Did you just hear that? As it is in the days of Noah. So it will be in the days of the Son of Man. So what happened there is a futuristic picture of what's going to happen when the Son of Man returns. It's like, look at this, think about this, picture this. They were eating and drinking, we read all this before, until the day that the Lord Noah entered the ark, what's the next words? And the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as in the days of Lot. We read all this before. Verse 30, it will be just the same on the day the Son of Man is revealed. So, let's just summarize Scripture really quick. What happened in the days of Noah? Okay, so the flood comes. Who gets to remain on the earth? Noah. Noah and his family. Are they considered the favored ones or the wicked ones? What? The favored ones remain? In the days of Lot, when Lot said, you know, Lot, get out of here. What happened to Lot? Did he get burned up and taken out of the earth, or did the wicked? The wicked did. Tell me about the parable of the wheat and the chaff. Who stays and who gets burned up and sent out? Yeah. The word is parolabono. Okay, that's the Greek word. You're like, what? Parolabono? Yeah. It actually sounds Italian, but it's not. It's Greek. It's a really cool word that means... 
Um, I was like, I got so many notes here. I have to have notes today. That's probably why it's so shotgun. Left behind, parallel mono. Okay. Let me get here. Usually means to take for oneself in favor of another, but not always. In this case, it has to be used with this. The word parallel mono is the same word that says that Jesus was taken into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. It's also the same taken that's used where Jesus is taken to the cross. Mm. Think about this. Mm. Let me give you some other scriptures to support the idea of the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Uh, Psalm 37, 9 through 11. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. That's Psalm 37, 9 through 11. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, and it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. A couple of scriptures later in Psalm 37. The wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. Proverbs. Oh, boy. I'm too fast. I'm going to read these to you fast. Proverbs 22. Sorry. Proverbs 2, 21, 22. For the upright will dwell in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the earth, and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. Proverbs 10, verse 30. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not inhabit the earth. Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness. Matthew 24, 39. And did not, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. I'm just giving you scripture. I'm just telling you what the scripture has always said to us for a really long time. But we have this, I just want to get out of this. Can you just save me? Here's the reason why I can't stand this rapture left behind idea. All right, I'm about to give you my opinion, and I'm sorry. But I'm going to tell you why. It's because this escapist mentality creeps into every area of our life. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And not only do we just want to escape from this wrath and this tribulation that's going to happen on the earth, which is a bunch of malarkey too, we want to escape every pain. Yes. And so any hard thing that happens in your life, because you're eventually going to be escaped and whisked away, you sidestep any process. You sidestep any hard thing that comes your way because you're one of the righteous. No. The whole point of this is to come through trials. Jesus said, trials will come. Tribulations will happen to you. We spend most of our life trying to avoid pain. Don't have to say amen. I know. I try. Yeah. The reality is you can't. No. The reality is it's actually in your life to bring forth the person of Jesus inside of you. Yeah. That's the whole point. <laughs> Think about this. When the persecution came to the people in Acts, it finally got them out of Jerusalem. And it started spreading the gospel. The greatest times in the kingdom in the last 2,000 years were under the greatest persecution. When Rome in 300 plus A.D., Constantinople, Constantine, you guys know this story, anyone a historian, and they say, okay, that's it, stop burning them, let's start worshiping the same Jesus as them. Well, that's a little bit of a turn about. They realize, this is, how the, this is how dumb the dragon is. If we can't kill them by burning them all, then we'll accept their faith and that will kill it. And it did. And from that moment on, started a degradation of the Christian faith and became the Dark Ages. And for hundreds upon hundreds of years, you hear very little about the kingdom. You hear very little about the gospel. You want to talk about the idea that let's legislate Jesus into the presidency and into the Congress and into the Senate? Go ahead and watch Christianity do this. Because it's, it's historically proven now. I don't, I'm not saying that I don't want good people to be in government. I'm just telling you, you don't spread Christianity by legislating it. That's right. true. The kingdom of God is legislated through the hearts of men. That's, right. That's the throne. Hello? 
Yes. Yep. Okay. So, all of this is really good. That means that we're actually here to inherit the earth. Yes. Right. So, why don't you just sit for a second, let this all settle in, and then suddenly say, I got a work to do here. Amen. And it's not just about getting people saved. Yes. That's a big part of it. But I want you to tell you, the gospel of good news is not salvation. The gospel of good news is that the king has come. Yes. And he's going to do what he always said he was going to do. He's going to have a kingdom, a family, a household on the earth. And the earth's like, yeah! yeah. So the earth gets it. Heaven gets it. There's someone in between in this sandwich that's got to get it. Amen. Yeah. And it's us. Yes. And when we get it and realize that Jesus came to empower, to uplift mankind, to fully become the glory of God on the earth, then Jesus is like, see, Daddy, come on, we're going to do this. And we come down and we join Him. Amen. And then we rule and reign here on the earth. Yes. Which goes back to who we are. Which goes back to who we are. Yes. That's why identity matters. That's true. Amen? Amen. Okay, we can talk more about this if you want to. i got more scripture to show you if you want it. Go study it for yourself. That's what the Bereans did. Bereans said, that sounds good, but I'm going to go study it for myself. You go do the same. Amen. Father, I want to thank you right now yes. that the truth makes us free. Yes. And what it really makes free is who we've always really been. That's what it makes free. So today, Father, I thank you that the truth is a person and his name is Jesus. And I pray that that truth would make us free to walk the way you literally died and resurrected for us to walk. May that happen. May we have a mindset to advance the kingdom of the earth. May we have a mindset that loves the earth, that loves people, that doesn't want to get away from sinners, but wants to love them so that the things we read in Proverbs and Psalms does not happen to my beloved, to the ones I love, to my neighbors. Jesus, come. Come when we mature. Come when we get it. Come when we've advanced your kingdom. And until then, empower us to do so. And one more thing. Bankrupt that movie in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I love you. We love you too. Have a great week.